Imagine that a human being has been subjected to an operation by an evil scientist. The person's brain has been removed from the body and placed in a bat of nutrients which keeps the brain alive. The nerve endings have been connected to a super scientific computer which causes the person to have the illusion that everything is perfectly normal. There seems to be people, objects, the sky, etc. But really, all the person is experiencing is the result of electronic impulses travelling from the computer to the nerve endings. Right now, we're inside a computer program? Is it really so hard to believe? A nightmare scenario? The stuff of science fiction? Perhaps, but of course that's exactly what you would say if you're a brain in a vat. Your brain may be in a vat rather than in your skull, but every experience is exactly as it would have been if you're living inside a real body in the real world. Welcome to the real world. The world around you, your chair, a book, a table, your hands, are all part of the illusion. Thoughts and sensations fed into your disembodied brain by the scientist's super powerful computer. This isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. You probably don't believe you're a brain floating in a vat. Most people don't. Most philosophers probably don't believe their brain in vats either. But you don't have to believe it. You only have to admit it. You only have to admit that you can't be certain that you're not. The problem is that if you do happen to be a brain in a vat, and you can't rule out the possibility, all things you know about the world will be false. And if that's possible, then you really don't know anything at all. The mere possibility appears to undermine our claims to knowledge about the external world. So is there any escape from the vat? The classic modern telling of the brain in a vat story was given by the American philosopher Hilary Putnam in his 1981 book Reason, Truth and History. But the germ of the idea has been around much longer. Putnam's thought experiment is essentially an updated version of the 17th century horror story, The Evil Demon, conjured up by the French philosopher René Descartes in his 1641 Meditations on First Philosophy. Descartes' aim was to reconstruct the edifice of human knowledge on unshakable foundations, for which he adopted his method of doubt. He discarded any beliefs susceptible to the slightest degree of uncertainty, after pointing out the unreliability of our senses and the confusion created by dreams, Descartes pushed his method of doubt to the limit. I shall suppose that some malicious demon of the utmost power and cunning has employed all his energies in order to deceive me. I shall think that the sky, air, the earth, colours, shapes and sounds and all external things are merely the delusions of our dreams which he has devised to ensnare my judgment. Among the debris of his former beliefs and opinions, Descartes despised a single speck of certainty, the cogito, on the apparently sure foundation which he begins his reconstruction. Unfortunately for Putnam and Descartes, although they're both playing the devil's advocate, adopting a sceptical position in order to confound scepticism, many philosophers have been more impressed by their skills in setting the sceptical trap than by their subsequent attempts to extract themselves from it. Appealing to his own causal theory of meaning, Putnam attempts to show that the brain in a vat scenario is incoherent, but at most he appears to show that the brain in a vat could not in fact express the thought it was a brain in a vat. In effect, he demonstrates the state of being an invatted brain is invisible and indescribable from within. But it's unclear that this semantic victory, such as it is, goes far to address the problem in relation to knowledge. Ordinary people may be tempted to dismiss the skeptic's nightmarish conclusions, but we should not be too hasty. Indeed, an ingenious argument recently devised by the philosopher Nick Bostrom suggests that it's highly probable that we are already living in a computer simulation. Consider this. In the future it is likely that our civilization will reach a level of technology such that can create incredibly sophisticated computer simulations of human minds and real worlds for those minds to inhabit. Relatively tiny resources will be needed to sustain such simulated worlds. A single laptop of the future could be home to thousands or millions of simulated minds. So in all probability, simulated minds will vastly outnumber biological ones. 
the experiences of both biological and simulated minds will be indistinguishable, and both will of course think that they are not simulated. But the latter, who will make up the vast majority of minds, will in fact be mistaken. We naturally couch to this argument in terms of hypotheticals about future. But who is to say that the future hasn't already happened? That such computer expertise has not already been obtained, and minds already been simulated? Hello, Neil. Who are you? I am the architect. I created the Matrix. We of course suppose that we are not computer simulated minds living in a simulated world, but that may be a tribute to the quality of the programming. Following the logic of Bostrom's argument, it is very likely that our supposition is wrong. Concordantly, while your first question may be the most pertinent, you may or may not realize it is also the most irrelevant. 